Hello, welcome. Well, today I'm going to be covering what we call the introductory lecture. I'll give you a really big picture of what we, get, what we actually do in enjoying a piece. Well, let's go back to how it all started. So back in the 60s, a guy called Dr. Francisco Cole, who's a Puerto Rican, found that as a child, he could actually talk with his spiritual helpers and get a two-way communication happening. So what happened was, uh, all the friends at school, they want to know how he did what he did. And so he showed them. Then as he grew in a teenager, teenager, the same thing was still happening. And then he started to realise that maybe this is what he's come here to do this lifetime. Share with other people how he did so easily, something he did really easily himself. So in the 60s, he started an organisation called the Inner Peace Movement. And this is the chart that you see in front of us. So it all starts with a guy in the middle we call Universal Man. So universal man is a soul that has a physical body. We're not a physical body that has a soul. So when I grew up, I was actually taught that I was a physical body that got a soul. So I had it all back to front. But that's just what they taught us at church. So we're actually four watts of energy. So us as a soul is four watts of energy. Science has been able to measure that. So the measure between a, a live person and a dead person, and the difference is four watts. They attribute that to the heat, the life force, and the intelligent part. So we're actually connected to our physical body by what's called a silver cord. And they talk about that in the Bible. So what happens is because we're four watts of energy, this radiates through our physical body, which is where we live, and that radiated energy we call an aura. So if you've heard an aura, you'll know what I'm talking about. So it's our energy shining through our physical body. So when we actually pass on, we sever the silver cord and we go back out to the universe, which is our real home, and our physical body stays here, which is what the Bible means, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. So we've gone back out to the universe. So remember before I said we're four watts of energy? Well, Einstein was able to show that energy is neither created nor destroyed. Well, if it's not created nor destroyed, that means it always was, it is, and it always will be. The universe is energy. All of the universe is just energy. That means it always was, it is, and it always will be. Now, here's the thing, because we're there for what's of energy, the universe is energy, that means we are already one with all things with the universe. You know, the funny thing about this is we've actually been taught that we're not one with all things, that we have to go and search out there somewhere for how we fit and how we connect. So we always, always have that longing for where do I belong. It's an eternal seeking of finding our tribe, finding out where I fit. Well, I'm here to let you know that we've always fitted, we've always belonged, and everybody's actually our tribe. Yes, there's certain states of consciousness that are the same as us, but at the end of the day, we're all one with all things, which is one with God. Now, a religious person will call this God. A scientific person will call it the universe. It doesn't really matter what you call it. But at the bottom line, at the end of the day, it is energy, and it's who we are. So let me tell you a little story about that. So let's just imagine... I'm wearing glasses and I pop them up here like this. And I forget I pop them up there. And I go around and do my business and I think, now where do I put my glasses? I look around the house, I can't find them anywhere. I go looking in the car, I can't find them there either. I think, what did I do with my glasses? I'm getting a little bit distressed at this particular point. A friend turns up the door. He says to me, John, he said, you're looking a bit distressed, what's happening? I said, mate, I can't find my glasses. I can't find them anywhere. And he says, oh, come on, John. He says, they're on top of your head. I go, oh, well, look at that. They are on top of my head. Now, here's the question. Will I be able to find my glasses out there somewhere if they're actually on my head? The answer is no. And it's the same with finding myself. Will I be able to find myself out there somewhere if I go looking? And the answer is no. The answer is always no. Why? 
because I'm in here. I am already one with all things. So if I'm out there looking for how can I become one with all things, and I'm looking out there, I'm going to be eternally looking, have an emptiness inside of me and a yearning that I can't satisfy. So that's what we do here in our organization. So my business is called Enjoy Inner Peace. And what I do is I go out there and I share all the materials that Francisco Cole shared with me um, over many years. And I'm out there and I share them within my business called Enjoy Inner Peace. Okay, so let's go over here to these two semicircles. The top one's called man's intellectual nature. The bottom one is man's feeling nature. The thing is, is we need both these halves of nature to be a whole. Religion calls the intellect the head and calls the feeling part the heart. Science calls the intellect part the conscious mind and the feeling part, the subconscious mind. So religion says head, heart, science says conscious mind, subconscious mind. We say intellect, feeling. So you kind of relate to one of those. So the thing is, every time I have a thought, I want to be able to balance it with a feeling. And every time I have a feeling, we have to balance it with a thought. What does that mean really? Well, let's say I'm an entrepreneur and I get this idea about a paperclip. I thought, how ingenious is this? I can create this paperclip and people are able to hold pieces of paper together. I get inspired, so I got the inspiration, I got inspired and I got into action. That's the feeling part. And then I was able to organise it to make it happen. That's the intellect. But we want to be able to balance our head and our heart to be able to have something happen. Very simple idea, paperclip, but it earns someone a lot of money. So the intellectual part of us is the, is the understanding part. It's the part of us that um, is out there seeking um, organisation, it's direction. It's a part of us that thinks and analyses. The feeling part of us is a part of us is the motivation, it's the creativity. It's a get up and go. It's a part of us that wants to belong. Feel the urge to connect. That's our feeling part. We need both to be in balance. When we're in balance, we can be at the right place at the right time or the right place at the right time. Very important to have them in balance. Most of us end up with one or the other. We'll talk about that in a minute. The consequences of that and what does it mean? But we're always striving to be in balance. So if we look at science. Science is actually born from man's intellectual nature. Because what's science all about? It's about analysing and dissecting. It's about analysing and dissecting everything around us. We want to know how the universe works. How does this tick? Why does it function like that? So science has been around a long time. And that's what it's always been about. Understanding how we're connected to our physical world. So religions, and I mean all religions, are actually come from or born from man's feeling nature. Because every single religion on the planet all started out with the intention of answering one specific question. Do you know what that is? Well, some of you got it. It's about, the question is, how do I fit where do I belong in the overall scheme of things? That's the question. Every religion then added in a whole of other rules and some dogma and you, know, you have to do this or you can't do that. And that's just how they operated as an organisation. Fundamentally, every religion started off to answer that one question. What's my relationship with my maker? Where do I fit? Where do I belong? So... Science and religion together is what makes up society. Society is our ticky-tacky boxes, our rules and regulations. It's everything about us that enables us to get on with each other so we don't infringe on the other person's right. So where do my rights end and someone else's rights begin? 
Interesting question. That's what the ticky tacky boxes help us to do. Now, traffic lights, that's a man made rule. That's not a universal rule, it's not a universal law. It's a man made rule. Just to enable us to get on better. So we get to those busy intersections, traffic ultimately flows. Although you might have to wait for a minute or two, and then you get a chance to go. It's a very important rule that makes a difference. Society has a couple of different parts. Science calls the positive and the negative. So the positive part is a good, kind, sharing, loving, and understanding part. And the negative part's not that. Religion says we have good and we have bad. So the good is a good, kind, sharing, loving, and understanding part. And the bad is not that. You start to see that the, the anything that's not love it's just an absence of it. It's not something extra. Like evil is not something actually out there. It's just an absence of love. It's actually an absence of who we really are, which is God. So it's all, once again, it's all about bringing things into balance. We can't have everything positive, nothing new. We have a balance. Everything's balanced. We look around the world, whatever's happening in the world right now, you might think there's more evil present, what is more good present? It's just one's in the surface and one's underneath, and it swaps over. So everything is in harmony. It's always in harmony. Now, here's the thing science, religion, and society, they all have truth in them, each one of them. But no one of them has all the truth. Now, when I first heard that, it made all the difference to me because I went through university. And I was highly trained in intellect, intellect, and I could work out all sorts of different things, how math works, science works, chemistry, all on a very deep level. And I've got friends at university that I went through university with, and some of them still believe that all the answers can be found in science. And one day they'll just find the God particle, and they say, that's what God is, is this little particle running inside an atom. And some of them still believe that. Now, religion. That has truth in it too, because it's born for man's feeling part. However, it doesn't have all the truth. And yet, I grew up in a religion, and I still have friends in that same religion who honestly really believe that all the answers will come from religion. And in fact, they actually shy away from science. They think science is trying to fool them. Science is trying to pull the wool over their eyes so they can't really see what's going on and have God talk to them in the church. Well... The thing is, is there's truth in all of these things. Now, society. Some people believe that all the truth is in society. We only live once. Nothing else matters. Whoever gets the end of the life and has the most accumulated stuff and has done the most things and visited the most countries, they win. And they think that's what life's all about. Well, there's truth in that, but it doesn't have all the truth. So once you start to realise that all these things have truth, then it's much easier to be compassionate and be in a space for the other people out there who think differently than what we do. The moment we start to make that space, we create a peace around us that we really haven't known before. And that peace is really quite extraordinary. That's what we aim to do in our program. So within Enjoying a Peace, we have workshops, we have weekly discovery sessions, we can come together weekly and work through a text and a book, and with some other people, you sit around in a circle. And what you work through is very simple, but an extraordinary thing has happened. You start to bring balance in your life. You start to bring balance with your intellect or your feeling, depending which one is dominant when you come and join and work with our program. So I work with discovery groups. Um, you can either do those uh, actually in a group. Or if you're isolated and you're out there on your own somewhere in a country town or uh, you're doing a lot of travelling so you can't just uh, be in a one place for a long enough period to do the 12 weeks of group work or the 8 weeks of group work, then you can do something we call a home study program. And a home study program enables you to work through very similar material as the group work, but you work through it on your own. And then once a fortnight, once a month, you can hook into a Zoom meeting from anywhere around the world and just get regrouped by a seasoned leader, someone who knows what they're doing, who can really support you to get the most out of that <clears throat> home study program. 
Okay, so let's have a look down here in this blank area, conveniently blank. What actually happens, let's get some water here. Thanks for being patient. Let's have a look in here in this blank area. Let's say we have two similar symbols to this. So the first one over here, it has a developed, developed intellect and an undeveloped feeling part. This is what we call out of balance intellectual nature. What happens with out of balance intellectual nature? These people are very organized and they think and analyze and dissect everything. These are the prove it to me type people. We want things to prove to them. So when you go and explain something to them, or you're having a conversation, they say, well, I'll believe you when you can prove it to me. That's what those people are. They're an out-of-balance intellect. So if you think of the intellect as the steering wheel of the car, as a feeling part, as the engine of the car, this gives you organization and direction. This gives you power and your movement forward. Some of those out-of-balance intellect, they like sitting in the car with the engine off, they go like this with the steering wheel. They're setting their direction, they get themselves organized, they're working out where they're going. At the end of the day, they don't go anywhere. Let's have a look at the other out of balance area over here. This is where we have a developed feeling part and an underdeveloped intellect. So, remember what we said the feeling part was about? It's about our get up and go, our creativity, it's about our inspiration. It's about a sense of belonging. So imagine someone who has that developed but not the direction, they're like sitting in a car with the engine on, foot on the accelerator, hands off the steering wheel. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going somewhere. Nothing wrong with that either. However, neither of these two out-of-balance states, out states of consciousness will get you to where you want to go. But we're being brought up to be that particular way because of our environment. Some things that our father and our mother have said. Some things we, we learnt in our education process at school or university. Or sometimes just some of the people around us in our environment. So if you want to know which one of those two you belong in, or which one you most hang around in, which you're most dominant in, I should say, have a look at your five closest friends. Are they more the prove it type me people? Who maybe they hang around at the bar and have a few drinks? Maybe don't really want to go home that much. They're looking for themselves outside of themselves. Those people become the workaholics, the golfaholics, and the alcoholics of society because they're looking for themselves outside of themselves. And most of the time they feel empty, not really quite sure what's missing. Or are the majority of, or the five closest friends, are they get up and go people? They're always involved in action and they seem like they're running around in circles, like they have a list of things to do the start of the day, and they do everything on their list for everybody else, and they don't do one thing on there for themselves. Well, that's what this is. They're always in action, but they're not organized to accomplish for themselves. That's out of balance feeling. Both of them are okay, like I said, but neither will give you what you're really after. So the game then becomes about bringing those two into balance. So no matter what ends up happening, you can bring them into balance. Our program, it doesn't matter which side of the, the sphere you're coming from, in the look of the feeling, the, pro, the same program for everybody in your group will all bring you into a central point where you're all balanced. Isn't that remarkable? Absolutely remarkable. I'm so in awe of what Francisco created with this program, which is why I've devoted my whole life to teaching other people around the world and helping them to get the same value that I got out of it when I first got involved. Okay, so bringing these two things in balance, that happens a lot in the group work. We do have courses. Uh, we also have books and CDs um, or MP4s, MP3s nowadays. So you can go to enjoyinapeace.com.au and you can purchase those and download them. Uh, some of the things are in physical, but most of them are electronic media. Just download them immediately, start listening to them, print them out if you want to. Um, that's up to you. So I encourage you to get involved in those materials and you can listen to them in your car, read them after hours, when you're on your own, etc. Okay, so what happens when you pass on and sever the silver cord 
when you are in a predominantly out of balance state of consciousness? Well, you'll end up here or here. Down here is what religion calls souls in hell or souls in purgatory. This is what religion calls souls in limbo. So let me explain what those really mean. So down here, we call these souls in confusion. And we're not saying they're bad or they're evil. We're just saying they don't know any better. We're just saying that they want the same things that we want, but they haven't had the grounding or the background or the support or the experience or the exposure to what it's actually like to really be loved, to what it's like to actually love. They don't have that feeling. And so they end up walking around after they've passed on, on planet Earth, just like they did when they're alive. Well, we call those ghosts or entity or disincarnated souls. No matter what you call them. But these are souls that have passed on. Now, can those souls harm us? Well, no, they can't. But what they can do is they can influence the way we think. And it's only because we think like that ourselves. Maybe a little bit, but they add to it, which exaggerates it for us. Like, have you ever been in a situation where perhaps you did something wrong by someone and you're apologizing? And you think you're nearly home. You think, yes, they've taken the apology. We're good to go again. And then all of a sudden it escalates and they get really upset. They get so upset way beyond the scale of what the misdemeanor was. Why did it happen like that? Well, because these souls here, they moved in on that person, like what happens in a schoolyard. I'm sure you've had that, at least in boys' schools that happen, where everyone go, fight, 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 and everyone run from all over the yard and um, crowd around the two or the three or the four people that were fighting. Well, that's what happens with these confusions. They feel a vibration that something happens happening that they're similar to, and they'll come and join in, and they'll add to the upset or the intensity of what someone's experiencing. So what happens is the next step, I actually go through and explain to you a technique that you can use every day at any time during the day that will bring a calmness all over you, regardless of what's going on around you. So these confused souls could move in close, and you start to pick up their feelings, or maybe start to get a headache, and you don't know why. And you use this technique that I'm going to teach you at our next event, and you'll just have this calmness come over you, and the upset will disappear, and the headache will disappear, and you'll feel bright and bubbly, and you'll feel connected, and you'll be able to just be in this lovely space, even though the people around you might be upset. And you can be really patient, waiting for them to get upset without forcing their experience or their opportunity to experience what they want to. Doesn't that sound interesting? I fell in love with that technique when I first, technique when I first used it. I couldn't believe its effectiveness. I've done a lot of stuff in my life up to that point. A lot of different organizations, a lot of different programs. I've never come across anything that was so simple and so effective and we give it away for free. Isn't that interesting? That's the most powerful technique we have and we give that technique away for free. Okay. So let's talk a little about this next one here, Limbo. A limbo. What's this all about? Well, I'm sure you all know people out there in your life, not you, of course, but we all know somebody who's a fence sitter who just doesn't want to make their mind up. You know, you might be Saturday night and you ring your friend up and you say, Hey, Mary, there's a whole lot of us going at this new restaurant in town. It's an Indian restaurant. Do you want to come along and try it with us? And Mary goes, Oh, yeah, look, um, Sounds like a good idea, but uh, I'll call you back and let you know. Think, okay. So then Mary gets another call from another group of friends and says, hey, look, there's actually fireworks happening in town tonight. Why don't you come and join us? We've got some rugs here. We're going to lay down in this nice embankment. We can have a good view of these um, fireworks. Why don't you come and join us? And Mary goes, you know, that's actually a really good idea. I, I'll, I'll, um, but I'll tell you what, I'll think about it and I'll get back to you. Then someone else rings up Mary. Mary, they say, there's a new show on in town. There's a new theatre production. And um, we're going to go along and see it. Why don't you come along and join us? And Mary goes, you know what? Sounds great. I'll call you back and let you know. And there's probably some other people call up the same night and ask Mary the same question. Well, guess what happens at the water cooler on Monday at work? Everybody walks up to Mary and they say, Mary, what happened? He never rang up. And Mary goes, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, like I meant to. Well, what happened? What did you end up doing? 
And Mary says, well, actually, I just stayed at home and watched television. Now, Mary had multiple opportunities to get involved in life, but she didn't. In the end, she actually elected to stay at home and not be involved in life, to be a passive participant, watching somebody else live life. That's really what television is. It's watching someone else live a life. It's not even your own. It's an imaginary situation. So that's what limbo is. So when someone passes on, they sever the silver cord, and they're prominent, predominantly out of balance state of consciousness, and they're in that situation where they're a fence sitter, they'll end up in limbo. They'll know what they need to do. They just don't do it. So once again, they wander around planet Earth just like they did when they were alive, and they just create a nuisance for themselves. So have you actually ever experienced having an argument with yourself in your head? Of course you have. We all have. Well, when that's happening, you can be sure of one thing, that only one of those voices is you. All the other voices in your head aren't you. They belong to either confused souls or souls in limbo. Souls are hanging around that you can't see, you can feel. They can get in your head and involve yourselves in a conversation that they have, and they have an opinion. And honestly, their opinion doesn't really matter. Your opinion does matter. So what we do in our program is we help you to differentiate between those voices. What's your voice and what's somebody else's? And you might go, well, that's easy, isn't it? It's, it's me talking. Well, most people say it's me talking with all the voices in there, but it actually isn't. And we actually take you through a process to help you distinguish between those different voices so you can start to quiet that monkey chatter, all that stuff that goes on in your mind. And some personality types, it just never stops. It just keeps going and going and going. So we show you how to quieten it. We show you down how to listen to the voice in there that works for you, that's got your backing and your support, not the other voices that don't. But that in itself is very, very empowering. Okay, now we get to the really fun thing. Let's see. What happens when you sever the silver cord and you're in a predominantly balanced state of consciousness? Well, you actually graduate. Because you'll have done what you've come here to do this lifetime, and you graduate planet Earth, and you become what we call a master soul and a sentient being, higher self, alter ego, spiritual helper, a spiritual guide, an angel, guardian angel. It really doesn't matter what you call them. I know people have got different ideas about angels and guardian angels. We don't get into all of that in this program. But at the end of the day, it's just the higher self. That's it. So that's what these three symbols are. These represent your team of spiritual helpers, and every one of us has a team. Every one of us has a team of spiritual helpers to support us and back us this lifetime. So how does this work? Well, our team of spiritual helpers, they give us suggestions, inspirations, and even warnings all throughout the day. As it turns out, they actually give us 50 suggestions every single day 50 that's about one every 15 minutes every 20 minutes now the bible says if you listen to your angels once in a thousand times they'll lead you to the way of rightness so once in a thousand times that's once every 20 days so if you listen to your angels once every 20 days you'll have a good life so what would happen if you listen to them once a week well you have a pretty good life what about if you listen to it once a day? You'll have an extraordinary life. All sorts of manner of things will just work out for you. And people look on at you and say, wow, everything just kind of seems to work for you. Just click in a place, don't they? Well, what happens if you start listening to your angels once an hour or once every couple of hours? Well, if you're one of those people, then you're one of those people that would change the planet. Because those people are continually connected in with the spiritual helpers and always listening, always listening for the next step. So continually at the right place at the right time like this, they're not wandering around wondering what to do next. They know what needs to happen next, even if it's only the next step. Sometimes we can't see very far ahead. That doesn't matter. We just trust that it's all being planned out for us. And that's what our spiritual helpers do. They plan things. They help make those coincidences happen. Who's had those coincidences happening here? But just that magic happened. You go, wow, I don't know how that happened. Well, 
This is how it happens. Your spiritual helpers are actually planning things in advance, a whole lot of synchronicity, so as when you turn up at the right place at the right time, all these things are there at the same place and the same time as what you are. And you might think, you know, I haven't seen Mary for a couple of decades. I'd love to catch up with Mary. That would be really lovely. We got on really well. We just lost contact. You don't know how to contact Mary. She's changed her name, got married, you know, it's uncontactable. And one day you're walking through a shopping centre and there's Mary walking towards you. This could be the same day or it could be the next week. You go, Mary, that's incredible. I was thinking about you all this last week. She says, I was thinking about you too. And she said, you know what's really interesting? She says, I live overseas. And I only just arrived here yesterday and I had a feeling come down to shopping centre today, in fact, this afternoon. Now, that wasn't a coincidence that she decided to go to the shopping centre that afternoon at the moment you were walking through. She could have moved into the store, you walked past, you had never seen her. That's not coincidence. That's your spiritual help that's working hard to get that synchronicity to work. And it only works because you're tuned into your feeling part and you're able to tune in and hear your spiritual helpers and follow their suggestions along the way. Follow the little breadcrumbs. So how do we get a team of spiritual help? Well, before we take on a lifetime, we're out the universe and we say, what would we like to do? Well, the first thing we choose is what I would like to learn for myself. That's the most important thing. How can I raise my state of consciousness this time on planet Earth with my opportunity? So this is what I want to learn. The next thing we choose is what I want to give back, what I want to share with the rest of the planet. We call that our outflow. So what we want to learn is our inflow. What we want to give back is our outflow. We want to have balance in those two. So your outflow is your service. That's the thing you're passionate about that you give back. You could be uh, sweeping streets. You could be tightening bolts in a factory. You could be a university lecturer. You could be the president of a particular country. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Every contribution is equal. No one's greater than or lesser than anybody else. Why? Because you're, whatever you're doing is important to make the whole thing work. It's like if you look at a watch, one of those old style watches, not the electrical ones, You've got all those springs and levers in there. Every single piece in there is important and just as important as every other piece to make that watch work. It's the same thing in society. There's no need to look down on somebody else that does a job that's different to yours. It's just a different job. It's not greater than or lesser than your job. So once we've got those two things sorted out, we then choose a team of spiritual helpers that we've known from a previous lifetime we have just mastered what we want to master this lifetime. Why is that? Because the people who are best people to teach something are the ones that have just learnt it themselves. Now, isn't that interesting? Team of choose a, we, team of choose, we choose a team of spiritual helpers and we make a contract with them. And they stay with us our whole lifetime. Even if we end up in confusion or limbo, they stay with us until such time at the end when we're back in the universe with our real home and we're regrouping with our spiritual helpers of our experience on planet Earth and what we learn about it and what we gain from it and how we raise our state of consciousness. So with our spiritual helpers, there's actually a profile you can do and that profile is called an orientation profile. It's a one-on-one -on -one, and in that profile you find out how many spiritual helpers you have and how many you have is dependent on what you come here to do. If you have one or two spiritual helpers, you come to work with inanimate objects. If you have three or more, you come to work with people. Because when you work with people, well, you know what? People are fickle. They tend to change their mind. It's like hurting cats sometimes. Trust me. You know, you go to pull all the cats in. One shoots over the fence. One goes up a tree. One goes in a house. One goes through your leg. But try to keep them all together. No, cat does whatever it wants to do. People are the same. Why? Because we've got free will. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you want to work with people as a collective, you need a little extra help. So you'll have three or more. Okay. So you'll find out how many spiritual help we have. you also find out where bats are touched in your physical body. Now, here's what's really interesting. Remember earlier on, the start lecture, I said we are four watts of energy. Remember that? 
Now, when, when our spiritual helpers graduate from planet Earth, they refine their vibration. So therefore, what's plus? Science ha hasn't been able to measure them exactly yet, but they know they are more than four watts. So when our spiritual helpers come down and physically touch us, their plus part of their four watts, when it touches us, it gives our electrical system an extra boost of energy. That's what we call goosebumps, tingling in the flesh, shivers up and down the spine, or the hackles that go in the back of your neck, all those things. We call those goosebumps, tingling in the flesh. And that's our spiritual helpers actually touching us. Some people call someone walked over your grave. So whenever you feel that, that's your spiritual helpers giving you reassurance. They want you to be alert because when you feel goosebumps, you become more alert. You're more present to what's happening around you. So you might be in a lecture. You suddenly get goosebumps. You tune in. You put the recorder on and rewind it and say, what was just said then? So you don't miss it. Or you might be in a dangerous situation. And you're feeling a little bit vulnerable. So your spiritual helpers move in and you get the goosebumps. You feel invincible. And you walk through that dangerous situation and nobody touches you. Why? Because they sense there's something odd about you. There's something more powerful about you than what meets the eye. And they want to, they want to take that risk and they back off. That's what happens when our spiritual helpers move in to support us. And our, what we do in our organisation in Enjoying a Peace is we work to support you to enhance that communication with your spiritual helpers. So in this orientation profile, we show you a technique where you get to ask questions of your spiritual helpers and get immediate yes, no answers back. So I don't know about you, but growing up, I grew up when you had a guardian angel. I talked to my guardian angel all the time. And every now and again, I'd see something symbolic in my environment. I thought, that's the answer that you're giving, me, giving back to me. But I never really had a conversation happen. Well, in this profile, it's a starting point of helping you develop a two-way communication where ultimately, over a period of time, you can actually be having conversation with your spiritual helpers in your head, not with the confused souls in your head, with your spiritual helpers, and you can distinguish between the two. There's other things you learn in the profile, but I'll explain those in a minute. So you can book into that profile. Just go to enjoyinapeace.com.au and have a look across the top where it says private consultations. Go down and click on it. It says uh, orientation profile. Send me a message saying you'd like to have a profile and we can do that for you. I can either fly into your town and do that profile or what I can do is do it over the internet. It's whatever ended up working depending how far you are or what the situation is. Okay, so the next I want to talk about is down the bottom, what we call the seven-year cycles. Now, these seven-year cycles, everything in the universe moves in seven-year rhythms. Everything on planet Earth moves in the seven-year rhythms. In fact, our whole body is changed over every seven years. Every cell after seven years is brand new. It's no, not the same cell that was there seven years earlier. So if you keep your mind set a particular way, the way you want your body to go, and you keep working on that, you keep having faith, moving towards that, and trusting that you'll take the right steps for that to happen, your body will keep regenerating it, regenerating itself in a more um, healthier manner instead of deteriorating as our thoughts deteriorate and our beliefs deteriorate and we give up on things and we lose hope, then our reproduction of the cells deteriorates and we age and we get sicker. Okay, so the second seven year cycles, we call this the cycle of the intellect. So the cycle of the intellect, this is when we start to develop our, uh, the first cycle, by the way, is, let's go back one. The cycle, First cycle is our feeling cycle. What happens here is we're all feeling. And because we're all feeling, we're soaking up everything happening in our environment. We're not laying in our crib looking at mum and dad fighting and saying, gee, that's a very disempowering way mum and dad are fighting. I don't think I'll do that. We soak it up and absorb it and go, wow, that's what I'm supposed to do when I'm married. And we just load it on a hard drive and then it's locked in. The second cycle is our intellectual cycle, 7 to 14. That's up here. So already we're starting to get balanced. So we're at school. We're learning about numbers. We're learning about language. We're learning about rules. We're learning about society. 
learning how to get on, relationships, we'll learn about all those type of things. But these are all things that help us be organized in our life. The third cycle is a cycle of identity, 14 to 21. It's also known as the rebellion cycle. So in this cycle, teenagers are really just fight, trying to find who they are. So what they do is they so say, no, mum and dad, I'm not going to do it your way. I'm going to find my own way. That's a normal part. That's what's supposed to happen in this cycle. You don't want to stop that from happening. You don't necessarily want to encourage it. They've got plenty of energy to do it for themselves anyway without us encouraging their rebellion. However, if you allow your children or your teenagers to rebel in a controlled fashion with things that don't really matter that much at the end of the day, they can start to exercise their own free will, start to learn to make decisions, start to find out who they really are. So they're not necessarily doing it mum or dad's way, but they're finding a way that works for them. Sometimes that can be a tricky process. It takes a little bit of extra help as a parent. So I know as a parent myself, I've been able to work with my spiritual helpers it helped me enormously to help me work with my daughter so I wasn't too overboard the other way. And even now they're doing all this work for 20 years. Yes, I was still confronted with stuff. That's what happens to parents and children. We get confronted with who our children have been because there's so much of us in them and it's a mirror. There's more about that another day. Okay, so usually by the time they get to 21, they'll have decided who they want to be. And most of the time, it's, it's very similar to who you and your husband are or mum and dad. That's just how it is. However, if you keep pointing out to them they're choosing your way, then you'll just set up a situation where they'll rebel for the rest of their life. And even though they really want to be like that, they won't be because you keep trying to force a particular way onto them instead of letting them choose it for themselves. So 21 and 28, this is called the cycle of maturity or the cycle of responsibility. This is when we start to really take responsibility for who we are this lifetime and what we've come here to do. 28 to 35, this is the cycle of searching for the kingdom within. This is when we earnestly look for what do I come here to do? What's my purpose? Why am I here? I actually came across this program when I was 28 years old, but pretty much within a month or so of it. That's not the case with everybody. My daughter was born into it. So it's not the same for everybody, but that's what it was for me. 35 to 42, that's a cycle of spiritual abundance. That's when I start to reap the benefit of my spiritual search from 20, 28 to 35. So then 42 to 49, there's a cycle of material abundance. So you can't do something in the physical here until you've done it in the spiritual first. That's the same with everything. Everything. You ever wondered why when you're sick, you heal yourself, but the sickness comes back again? That happens because we haven't changed it on the spiritual level. We change the spiritual level and then we heal it on a physical. That particular illness won't come back again. Because the illness is just a reflection of what we haven't noticed on the soul level first. The 49 to 56, this is a cycle of inventory. It is when we take stock of our life and we say, what have I done? What have I accomplished? Am I on track? Am I off track? Am I on target? 56 to 63 is a cycle of decision. So the cycle of decision, well, you know, if I'm too far off track when I did the inventory, that means I'll usually sever the silver cord, I'll go back to the universe, and I'll decide to have another go later, perhaps. Or maybe I am on track. Or maybe I'm only a little bit off track and I can still get back on track. And then I make the decision to stay. So from 63 onwards, I can actually end up doing my greatest works. And that's onwards, that's the little plus there. So it doesn't matter how old you grow to, they're your greatest works. I know. I know a lot of people who've retired who went on and did work which they say they spent the first 60 years practicing. They didn't know that at 58 or 55 or 40, that all those things they're doing there were getting them ready for the great work they were going to do after they retired. Not that, that that's what it's all about. You can do your great work now, whatever age you are, but that's how it can work out. All right, let's talk about these four words over here. Intuition, vision, prophecy, and feeling. 
Well, we all actually have four personality types or types of communication or types of perception. It doesn't really matter what you call them. We have all four of these, but we've chosen a particular order. So I'm going to go through and talk about each one individually as your first type of perception. And you can start to maybe get an inkling of yourself or some of the other people around you. And then I'll start to explain how they interact with each other. All right, so the first one, intuition. Well, intuition is also called our clear audient part, which is French for clear hearing. So the intuition part of us, for those, particularly for the people who have first gift intuition, it's all about the sound, the tone of voice, and the words. It's about understanding. So when you're communicating with someone who's first gift intuition, it's really important to choose the tone of voice and to choose your words carefully because they matter to that particular personality. So someone who's first gift intuition, they're what we call the born leader. They naturally step into that leadership role and they're very comfortable with it. So, you know, in the schoolyard when a child is labelled a ringleader, that's actually not a bad thing, although we've been given it bad connotations. It's actually not. It just means that child is probably first gift intuition. They're natural and they feel comfortable with um, their leadership abilities. The other kids sense that, so they automatically pop them in that leadership role and are happy to follow them. That's all that means. So that's the born leader part of us. And the people with first give intuition, they have a lot of red in their aura. So let's look at the second one. Vision, or the type of perception called vision. This is also called the clairvoyant part, which is French for clear seeing. So we've all heard about clairvoyance. That's a very common one. Well, that's someone who has the first gift of vision. That's that clairvoyant part. So the gift of vision is all about harmony. It's all about seeing things, the first impressions. It's about how we come across to other people. It's about making sure that things flow. Some of his first gift vision can see how energy moves through a project and they can see how to get things done. So they see pictures in their mind's eye. It's like a movie that flashes through a picture. It's so, through so fast. So some of his first gift vision, they see things in their mind's eye. They can visualize things really easily. These are the people where the whole house will be neat and tidy, but you go into the bedroom and there'll be a bit of a mess. Piles of paper or piles of something or stuff shoved under the bed. So it's out of sight, it's out of mind for the first condition. They're also very good with empathy. So that's the gift that can um, put themselves in another person's shoes and know what that experience is like. Some of his first gift vision, they have a lot of yellow in their aura. Okay, the gift of prophecy. Well, this is the gift of inner knowing. Part of us that is, we call it the um, all-knowing gift. So it's prophetic. It um, sees things in the, in the future. Um, it just knows things. Some of his first gift prophecy, they'll finish sentences before you do. And you go, how do you know that's what I was going to say? And they go, I just know. So they often say things, I just know. They don't know how they know, but they know that they do know, even though they know not how they know. So someone's first gift prophecy, they have a lot of purple in their aura. So often as children, they'll see something happen in their mind's eye, in a picture or a prophecy, and then it will happen and come true. And if they don't really understand what the gift's all about, they can sometimes think that they caused whatever happened, the tragedy or the mishap or, or even the good thing that happened. They'll think that they caused it. But when they actually understand they're seeing something in the future that was going to happen anyway, then they can actually accept the, the skill and the sensitivity that they have and have it work for them. But often what happens is someone who first gets prophecy has a gift shut down because it frightens them. So, the fourth gift, the gift of feeling. The gift of feeling, this is also called the clairsentient part, which is French for clear touch. So people first get feeling, they're very tactile. They touch you a lot. They'll 
hold your hand when they shake it, they'll touch your arm or your leg when they're speaking to you, they'll hug you and tend to hang on a bit longer than what most people do. They're really into the environment, family orientated. Um, they just love people. They're really easy going. Um, they love all the detail. Um, they're into all that little stuff. They're also what we call the born follower. Now, that doesn't mean they can't lead. Of course they can lead. Why? Because they have an intuition part. But the feeling part is absolutely the born follower part. They just want to follow. They love to find somebody who knows where they're going and step in behind them and follow them. They feel really happy. They're the doers of our society. There's more people with first gift feeling than any other gift out there. The next one is a gift of intuition, gift of vision, and then the gift, gift of intuition, then the gift of prophecy. They're in roughly that order of the numbers. Okay, someone who's first gift feeling, they have a lot of blue in the aura. They love the color blue. That's quite funny, actually. I'm actually first gift vision. So growing up, I always wanted to have the yellow bath towel in the bathroom, so we knew it was my towel. All, all my siblings and myself and my uh, mother, we all had our own coloured towel. As it turned out, it actually matched our gifts that we had later on, which I thought was really quite funny. So I love the colour yellow. And my second gift is the gift of prophecy, and I love the colour purple. So the yellow and purple, I love putting together. So let's talk about these gifts. So with the gift of vision, with the someone who has a gift of intuition, <laughs> someone who has a gift of intuition as the first gift, they will need to hear their partner say, "I love you." Someone who has the gift of vision first, they need to see their partner's love demonstrated to them. Someone who has the gift of feeling first, they need their partner to touch them for them to know. That their partner loves them. Now, someone who's a gift of prophecy, it doesn't really matter. Because someone who's first gift prophecy, they know if their partner loves them or not, no matter what they say or do or how they touch them. So let's use an example here. Let's say first gift intuition marries first gift feeling. And after seven years, notice I said seven years down here in the seven year cycle. After seven years, they just haven't been able to make a click, move to the next cycle. And they get the seven year itch and they have this big fight. And first gift intuition says, You don't love me anymore. And first gift feeling says, Of course I do. I touch you every day, I hold your hand, I cuddle you. And first gift intuition says, Well, anyone can cuddle you and touch your hand, that doesn't mean anything. You stop saying, I love you. Then first gift feeling says, Well, as a matter of fact, you don't love me anymore. And first gift intuition says, well, I say to you, I love you every day. And first gift feeling says, well, anyone can say I love you. That doesn't mean anything. You've stopped touching me years ago. They had this big fight. They realized there's going to be no room for reconciliation. And they filed a divorce. And it's all over. But if they actually understood what the other person needed, not what they wanted to give them, often we give other people what we need ourselves. But when we can recognize what the other person needs and we can give them that, then we all end up getting what we want and the relationship actually works. It's quite remarkable, really. Same thing with our children. When we can start to recognize within our children what they need, it makes a huge difference. An example. Let's say your child is first gift feeling. Well, first gift feeling are really tactile, remember? They need a lot of touching. They need hugging. So when a first gift feeling child is upset, it's really important to hug them. No matter how upset you are, no matter how upset they are, it's really important you hug them. So in our household, we had a rule. It didn't matter how upset either of us were, my wife and I or my daughter, if my daughter said, I need a hug, we just had a hug. That was it. We could even resume the fight later if we wanted. But in that moment, we hugged because that's what she really needed for her to feel secure. Each one of the gifts has their own unique particular thing that you can give them as a child that makes all the world a difference. You start doing that, the child starts to feel comfortable in their own skin. They stop fighting you. They stop trying to find their place. If you find they're arguing with you all the time, 
because they don't know where they fit. You start to treat them with their first gift in the way that they need, there will be a synergy that happened with you and that child that you didn't think was even possible. Now, isn't that interesting? What kind of difference would that make in your life? Well, I'm sure it make quite a lot of difference. I know it didn't mind. I wish I had that as I was growing up. I had a very understanding mum. She was really great with all this stuff, very spiritual person. But she still didn't know all this detail. That would have still helped. So that's the big picture of what we do in our program. We go through and we help people get balance in the life between their intellect and feeling. We help you specifically to enhance your communication with your spiritual helpers. So you start to build that relationship where you can tap into your own inner wisdom and the wisdom of all time and find answers for questions that you have that work for you specifically. Not what somebody else thinks you should be doing. Not what someone else wants you to do, but what's actually right for you. Now, it doesn't mean to say you exclude everybody else. No, it doesn't work like that. You set your goals. I want to have a harmonious relationship with my partner. Then you'll get inspiration and suggestions from your spiritual helpers that will help that happen. We're in unusual times right now with restrictions on how we can meet with people face to face. So from here, if what you've heard sounds interesting to you, um, the next step is for you to book an orientation profile and learn about your spiritual helpers and your four gifts. You could also order a um, home study program and work through that in your own timing. Um, so that's extremely good value, that one. Uh, read some of our e-books or listen to some of our um, audios. So down below, you'll see some links to those features. You can book yourself into an orientation profile. I can do those locally, um, depending on where you live, um, or I can do them over the internet. We, I send you a Zoom link and we do it over the um, internet, and that's perfectly fine. So I hope you've, um, you've got what you needed. If you're interested in more information, click on any of those below, and I look forward to being of service.